This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. UFC 287 is coming up this weekend. Some potential final dances for some of those fighters. We're going to break that down with Austin Swaim getting his read on the card for this weekend. We'll also talk some baseball later on to get you ready for what should be a fun weekend of sports. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here, as mentioned, by Austin Swaim. Check him out on Twitter at a Swain three, find his work over at numberfire.com and on the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed. Austin, happy UFC weekend to you. How you doing? I am doing very well. Um, a, a place that I have family down in South beach. So they are excited about UFC 287 down in Miami. We got lots of sports coming this weekend, Easter weekend. So the vibes are good. You should have bribed someone at FanDuel to send you there. Um, <laughs> you know, I've considered bribes for like when they have the, the world fantasy like football championships and stuff like that. I've considered bribing the staff to try to get me to MC those. Cause I typically do, but like, I want to ensure my spot. Right. I don't think that they will take bribes because they are people of integrity. However, right. I'm not above trying it at least to like <laughs> finagle my way there. So maybe next South beach event, we can, uh, we can, uh, tug on some ears, try to get you in there. Oh, that'd be, that'd be sweet. I definitely miss that weather in Denver. We got snow that passed through here, still chilly in the forties. So I would take a trip to South beach right now. I need that that temperature up so that my uh, Coors Field home run props don't uh, do as poorly <laughs> as it did yesterday. Kyle Freeland, apparently an ace. And so it was Josiah Gray. Who knew? Not me. Oh, well, <laughs> that, went, that went poorly. So what we'll do for today is break down USC 287. Talk to Austin about all that. And later on, we'll talk about uh, the MLB slate for today as well. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed. If you want some thoughts on the Bristol Dirt Races, both Trucks and the Cup Series, those are up in yesterday's show. There's a timestamp for that so you can skip beyond uh, the basketball stuff and the basketball and the hockey Skip over there, check out Bristol Dirt if you want some of that. Uh, And then also hit subscribe on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating. And you can find all these shows over on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. Let's kick things off, though, Austin, and talk about UFC 287. The main event for this weekend is Alex Pereira taking on Israel Adesanya. You know, right now, Adesanya is minus 146 in the money line to win this event. So when you look at this one, Austin, what's your breakdown of this fight? And how do you think see things playing out here? So, it, you know, it, it's obviously a great fight. Alex Pereira is the first middleweight to ever beat Israel Adesanya. So we're excited to see what happens in the rematch. I think some people felt like Pereira got lucky. It was a very odd year in 2022. Uh, most fifth round title fight finishes ever. And typically you do not see those in title fights, fighters minding their weapons, making sure that they make it to the cards if they're ahead. But we saw three of them, including this one. And I don't really feel like he got lucky because that fight was very, very close, especially with the state of mixed martial arts judging in 2023. That fight really could have gone either way, especially when Pereira, with this flurry that he ended up winning the fight with, would have had the most signature moment of the entire fight. And now I'm not surprised to see Adesanya coming back as uh, as a favorite. We see this a lot with stars where their money line does get juiced a little bit. As the Adesanya, probably the biggest star in UFC this side of John Jones, now that Conor McGregor's kind of faded out. Uh, of the sport full time. And I really, the story of this fight will be adjustments. You know, Adesanya's lost three times to Alex Pereira now, twice in kickboxing, once in mixed martial arts. And there's a rumor that Adesanya is probably going to mix in some wrestling this weekend to try to uh, avoid what Alex does best. But the thing is, Adesanya has never been good at that. He has just a 14% takedown accuracy. His one and only takedown landed was against Pereira in the last fight. And he only went one for four on those attempts. He's a big, strong dude to take down. Uh, you know, Pereira is training. And the thing I think about Alex is he only has eight pro MMA. MMA fights. So he's actually learning a lot between these fights, whereas a veteran like Israel Adesanya, well over 10 fights in UFC, he kind of is what he is at this point. And with I I have Izzy Adesanya's expected takedown success below 15%. In that case, I can pretty much project a striking match here, and I do think striking success rate tells the story. Pereira plus 1.6, Izzy Adesanya plus 1.13 historically. I think he's just a touch ahead there, so I do like Pereira as an underdog, and he's a slight favorite according to my stuff so um very 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 palatable at this number so right now as you mentioned Pereira's money line is plus 116 it sounds like 
you're expecting this to potentially go the distance. Am I hearing that correctly in the way you were discussing this match? Or what's your read on how Pereira might be able to win this one? So there was not a lot of volume, not a lot of activity mm-hmm. in the last fight. Neither fighter eclipsed 100 significant strikes. So there really aren't enough signature moments to expect a big time finish. Now, there's all this conjecture about, you know, maybe Alex has gotten a lot better grappling since he's training with longtime UFC champion Glover Teixeira. Um, I tip, I do lean that way. I don't really have any value compared to the number right. one is to go the distance. Um, the thing about an inside the distance prop, if you feel good and you feel strongly about under four and a half rounds in this fight, that significantly favors Pereira. Uh, Izzy Adesanya's knockdown rate um, in middleweight defenses is less than like 0.8%. So it's very, very small. Hasn't really shown that elite power that he did against lower level guys coming into the sport. Um, and, he, and he's also shown historical durability and excellent defense, a 58% striking defense. So um, I do tend to lean toward a close fight that goes to the cards. But if it stops early, I'll feel much better about Alex Pereira's money line. Okay, so Pereira money line plus 116 is the bet Austin likes for this headliner here for UFC, and that's the one bet we are locking in here. Let's open up the rest of the card to you, Austin, though, because we have plenty of other fights here available. Looking at uh, money lines on the rest of this card, including the prelims, where are you seeing value there? So I see value with a guy that I've spotted just about every time that he's fought. He's been the underdog in every single fight that he's had in UFC thus far. That is Chris Curtis. He's coming back at plus 108 uh, on FanDuel Sportsbook when I checked last night. And uh, if I can project a striking match without much interference, my data set is really good at re- predicting that. And Chris Curtis is a guy that helps make that a reality for me. 100% takedown defense on 32 attempts face. And Kelvin Gastelum. 32% takedown accuracy, not a lot of volume there. He's not an elite guy out there. Better guys have tried and failed to get Curtis to the ground, so I feel very good about a striking match here. And if, in that case, there's just a gulf in striking ability and offense here. 15 whole percentage points between these guys as far as striking accuracy is concerned, and Curtis lands nearly six per minute, gas limit just three and a half per minute. So Curtis is more active. He's more accurate. And the issue for me is with Curtis is that he's been too willing to fall behind. He's He's a guy that thinks I'll get my reads and I'll find the knockout blow. But the problem is, as you're doing that, if you're absorbing too many punches, as he's bottom three on this card in strikes absorbed, you can lose a decision. I would love to see him reverse that trend here because he's got every reason to with a four inch reach advantage. I mentioned he's more accurate. Some key trends I'm looking at here. Curtis is five and one in UFC affiliated appearances as an underdog. And he's two and oh in UFC when he has a reach advantage like this one. So I think he leads the dance and I do think he wins a striking match here against Gastelum. You mentioned the money line was plus 108. It is still right there at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, for Chris Curtis versus Kev, uh, Kelvin Gastelum, that is on the prelim card uh, mm-hmm. over on the FanDuel Sportsbook if you're looking for the navigation there. Uh, Curtis plus 108 on the money line. Any other money lines you like here for Saturday, Austin? So I will flip over to the main card, and it is a fight that is absolutely a dynamic we see in UFC a lot. We have young prospect rising, maybe fallen star descending, who ends up winning out when those two clash. I like Rob Plant, who is the quote-unquote descending star here. He's coming back around plus 150. Uh, there's this card. It has a lot of prospects that are elite. Adrian Yanez is one of those, but when he has been a top 10 guy for years and he is one of my data's favorite fighters. And it kind of shows the flaws of doing this with just data because Rob Font has a plus 2.43 striking success rate. It's top three on this card. It's one of the best marks at Bantam weight. The problem is he's just a high volume guy that works behind his jab. There's not a lot of power or danger that comes with those strikes, just a 0.54% knockdown rate. Still, I really like him in this particular spot because I, significant questions about Yanya's and that's kind of what happens with UFC the they face these guys that don't really test these abilities and then they get to this top shelf level where every guy can do everything and that's fun Yanya's hasn't faced a grappling threat um, only five low quality takedown attempts so far. Whereas Font, he's not an amazing grappler, but he took down Jose Aldo. He took down uh, Cheeto Vera in his last two consecutive fights. So if Yanez can't grapple at all, this one's going to be a rout. But if you look on the feet, he can still have success against Yanez. Uh, Yanez's knockouts have come against guys that are five. 11 and one in UFC. They're not talented fighters. They're not beating anyone else. Hardly. Um, that is not Rob font. Rob font is a guy that absolutely dismantled Cody Garbrandt. He's a high level fighter. Um, and I trust him with a reach advantage to get this done in another similarly projected striking match. And if it's not a striking match, I know Rob fonts dominating it. So you mentioned before that we can see stars like Adesanya get a bit of juice on their money lines because people know them. Is there a similar dynamic with prospects, uh, like Yanez where, 
there's a bit of unknown. So people get excited about that yeah. or is, is it a different dynamic there? Yeah, for sure. You know, you and I have, have talked on here about Sugar Sean O'Malley before as he's been rising up the UFC ranks. Um, a, there are a couple other guys on this card, 18-year-old Rahul Rosas Jr., uh, Ignacio Bahamondes. These electric prospects that are knocking everybody out, putting up big striking numbers, they really kind of just ascend to this meteoric rise until they reach, they reach the place that their trajectory is supposed to be. Because yeah. the gap in the champion in a UFC division and the guy that is right on the fringe entry level is a canyon. And so you're exactly right that these money lines do get juiced for prospects because we think they're unbeatable uh, until we find out they are. Okay. So uh, Austin is on the Rob Font money line at plus 152, Alex Pereira plus 116, and Chris Curtis at plus 108. We have a lot of props, though, uh, across the board here for UFC. When you look at those, Austin, any stand out to you as being good values right now? So I will stay on the main card with an, an interesting fight. And by the way, your listeners here on the cover and the spread get it first. Over on my DFS <laughs> podcast of my own here, this uh, fight between Kevin Holland and Santiago Ponzinibbio is actually going to be Austin's fight of the night this week. Oh, you guys got it first. Right. Um, I think I both it. sides are viable in daily fantasy, which means this fight's going to be a back and forth war. And I like over two and a half rounds here. Uh, it's sitting at plus 108 on FanDuel Sportsbook. I think we just have an overrated amount of power in this fight. Uh, Kevin Holland only has a 0.49% knockdown rate since moving to welterweight last March. Santiago Ponzinibbio, just 0.25% since he had a lot of injuries, a huge multi-year layoff, and he's just come back and he's not quite, he doesn't quite have his fastball anymore, right? And I, in that respect, these guys, neither of these guys wrestle, both average less than half a takedown per 15 minutes. So we've got a striking match here. There's not a lot of power. I love over two and a half as these guys trade. And by the way, people are worried about Kevin Holland is potentially this accurate guy that lands with power. Santiago Ponzinibbio, excellent 62% striking defense. So the guy with power is facing the better defensive fighter. I love the way this sets up to see all 15 minutes. And it sounds like based on your read of this match, you want to see all 15 minutes too, not just for your bet, but also like from a, a viewership perspective, sounds like you'd be into that as well. Oh yeah. This fight should be a banger for sure. And, and, um, I will have a lot of this fight in daily fantasy on both sides. So I am hoping, yeah, it goes to the judges. We get plenty of significant strike points over on the DFS side. Yeah. Okay, so that is Holland versus Ponzinibbio, uh, plus 108 to go over two and a half rounds in the popular section over at FanDuel Sportsbook if you're looking for that prop there. What about other props? What else are you seeing uh, for right now for Saturday? So, so you've probably, you probably can relate this like with NASCAR. I almost feel gluttonous going back to a spot that I've gone to over and over again. It just Ty gives top 10, and, baby. Ty gives top right. 10. <laughs> I know <laughs> exactly what you're talking back about. To the well, right. And I'm going here with Gerald Mearshart by submission. Uh, it was sitting at plus 360, but I would not be surprised if it shortened whatsoever uh, because I've seen a lot shorter numbers at other books, but I, I can't help but go back here with Mearshart when I look, 77% of his fights have been won by submission in his pro career, 27 of 35. He averages 1.70 submission attempts per 15 minutes, which is a top three mark on this card. It is really his one plus skill in UFC. And I just have questions about his opponent here. Jim, you would, you would appreciate this as someone that I know your banter, his opponent, Joe Pfeiffer comes out and says, Gerald Mearshart sucks, which is in my opinion, not good. Got not a good thing to say to someone who's going to be punching you in the face in a couple of days. But the reality is I could make that argument sooner for Joe Pfeiffer because the only fighter Pfeiffer has fought and beaten in UFC is actually the UFC record holder for fewest significant strikes landed with a minimum of four fights in 20 minutes. He is <laughs> a, a, Alan Amadovsky did not do anything in UFC and Joe Pfeiffer thinks that he's a world beater now that he knocked him out. I think the 10 time winner in UFC Gerald Mearshart here really gives Joe Pfeiffer a lesson and Mearshart looked improved on the feet in his last fight. He knocked down Bruno Silva. Who's a guy that went all 15 minutes with Pereira. Like I think Mearshart is still improving this deep into his career and he's a great submission guy. So I think he does use his weapon of choice um, to dispatch of the prospect Pfeiffer here. Uh, I am someone who believes you should get 15 year penalty for not taunting after a good play. So I am, uh, I am pro trash talk regardless of whether you're good. I think if you suck, it's way funnier. So honestly, I'm in, I'm in, you know, yeah. I respect the Joe Piper, the, the trash talk, but I, I understand where you're coming from with the, with the mere sharp by submission. That's in the method of victory. Uh, plus 360 is uh, still where it is for that one from your sharp versus Piper. Honestly, like, if we could like trash talk like on this show, that'd be fun. Like I, 
I would never because I love my guests um, and I don't want to trash talk myself because that's weird. But like, I wish there were aspects of my life where I could trash talk, like play F1 manager, the video game. I can't trash talk a Williams as I fly by them. That seems kind of weird. Um, so I need to find an outlet in my life where I can trash talk because it's uh, it's one thing I'm missing pretty sorely right now. I absolutely feel like you would be the Kevin Garnett of the betting sports radio landscape. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think he's on another level. Um, I don't think I can get there. I'm bad at trash talk. That's Maybe that's why I respect it so much is because I'm bad at it. So uh, Joe Pfeiffer, full respect, man. Salute to you. But I would like to win some money. So yes, uh, we're cheering for Gerald Mearshart there uh, to win by submission. That is Austin Swain. You can find him on Twitter at aswain3, as he mentioned. Uh, the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast for UFC 287 coming up later on today to hear more about these matches from a DFS perspective. I'm pretty sure I'll have time to fill out a lineup. So checking out your helper, checking out uh, the heat check as well. Austin, have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for your insights. Good luck to you. And we'll talk to you again soon. That sounds good, Jim. Have a great weekend. All righty. Again, that should be up on the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed later on today. Check out Austin on Twitter at aswain 3 And if you want to play the DFS side, check out the helper there. That'll be up on number fire as well. We're going to dive in to today's MLB slate later on. Talk about some money lines and strikeout props. I like, but first a reminder, grand slams, no hitters and double plays are back. And there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel America's number one sports book. That's because right now new customers can step up to the plate with a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. So don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball, must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-A-HOPE-N-Y or text hope and y And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. As we talk about the MLB side of things for today, not a whole lot I am seeing as far as value on money lines based on my model. The one spot I do like based on what I'm seeing, based on the model I trust the most right now, I do like the Pirates at plus 114 against the White Sox, and that does feel icky. Not super high on the Pirates personally. Rich Hill is starting. I think Lucas Gili look, looked pretty good in his first start this year. So on the surface, not a huge fan of this, but I understand what the model is saying. I think what it's saying is it's more so that it's lower on the White Sox and consensus than being higher on the Pirates. The White Sox defense, pretty bad. Their bullpen in its current state is not good. And the offense is fine, although they do get a boost today by facing a lefty instead of a righty. I do like, again, what we saw from Lucas Giolito in his first start this year. Giolito is a guy who struggled a lot last year and a guy I was going against pretty often, whether it be DFS or talking about uh, unders and strikeout props, opposing money lines and stuff like that. I thought he was better in that start last week than he was most of last year in a very tough matchup with the Astros. But starting pitching isn't everything. So my model has the Pirates as slight favorites in this game. Implied odds at plus 114 are 46.7%, and I'm willing to ride at the model here despite not being all that high on Pittsburgh. They are at home. That matters quite a bit. Uh, they have other stuff, like the defense is better. Offense is fine. Bullpen is fine. I think that's enough where this game might be closer to a toss-up than what the uh, sports books are saying. So plus 114, the Pirates, the one money line I like for today. There are two strikeout props that I like. There was some movement on these earlier this morning, so do you want to check to make sure they are still available at the numbers I was looking at. But the ones I wanted to go to, 
A couple of unders. Uh, the first one is Jack Flaherty against the Brewers. I was looking at under five and a half. It was uh, minus 114 earlier on today. We'll pull that up right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. See where it is right now. Minus 122 right now in Jack Flaherty. So it has moved a bit more towards the under. That is still okay. Minus 122, a fair number for me. And Flaherty stays in the Brewers. They're Definitely a team that will strike out, but they also draw a lot of walks. The Brewers' active roster has a 10.6% walk rate versus righties since the start of last year. That's a big concern for Flaherty, who walked seven guys in his first start this year. And we saw that with Flaherty last year, when he came back as well, had some troubles with control. And that jacks a pitch count, and a higher pitch count means it's tougher to get deep in games. Now, Flaherty is stretched out. I have projected for 97 pitches for tonight. but the walks concern me. 4.7 strikeouts projected for me with Jack Flaherty. He needs six to get the over here. So I'm fine betting against that. Minus 122, a bit uh, juicier than it was before, but still a fine number of my me and one I'm willing to bet. So Jack Flaherty in the Brewers and the Cardinals game, I want the under there at minus 122. The other one is Chris Bassett. Uh, I want four and a half. Uh, the under here for Chris Bassett facing off with the Angels for today. And the under on this one is now minus 128. That's getting closer to the point where I step off, but minus 128 is still a value for me. I have the odds on an under four and a half for Bassett at 60%. So as long as it's less than minus 150, I still think there is value on Bassett to go under four and a half strikeouts. I am projected for 3.95, which is why the under is uh, so high there for me. And that projection for Bassett includes last year's data as well. So it's not just a reaction to what we saw in the opener, but maybe it should be because last week was really rough. He had no strikeouts, got chased early. The velocity for Bassett was really bad. And it comes after a really rough spring training. So... That would be one thing if we were just reacting to what Bassett did last week where he had no strikeouts, velocity was bad, it could be an overreaction to one start. But this is not just one start. Again, it does include some data from last year, and even then, it has a strikeout projection at 3.95. So regardless of whether you want to put stock in last year or just react to last week, I think both those things do point towards an under for Chris Bassett against a very good Angels offense. Again, I have the under here at uh, 60%, so if you can get it before it gets to minus 150, I would take it. If it goes down to 3.5, again, I've got it at 3.95, so I probably would step away if it does go down to 3.5. Um, I think at that point I would be okay stepping away. But with it currently at 4.5, minus 128 on the under, I still think there is value there. So Chris Bassett under 4.5, minus 128, Jack Flaherty under uh, 5.5 at minus 122, and then... Uh, going with the Pirates money line of plus 114 against the White Sox for today. That's all we got across baseball and USC for today. But we are back once again next week, breaking down everything across the sporting landscape. As always, new podcasts every weekday on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. So make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts. And again, check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. Subscribe there. And if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating or on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. We appreciate those of you who have been doing so. Big thank you once again to our guest, Austin Swain, for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on UFC 287. Find him on Twitter at aswain 3 Find his work over at Number Fire and find his DFS podcast, The Heat Check, over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Reminder, our Bristol Dirt podcast is up on the Covering the Spread podcast feed already and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. I hope you all have a fantastic holiday weekend. Uh, for those of you who are celebrating, good luck to you across your bets. We'll talk to you once again Monday to talk about some Major League Baseball. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 